We hebben hier vanavond niemand minder dan Alex Mustard. Uh, iedereen kent Alex uh, als uh, een zeer toonaangevend onderwaterfotograaf. Um, en uiteraard um, volgen al de onderwaterfotografen onder ons uh, Alex al uh, alle ja- of al die jaren dat hij actief is in de onderwaterfotografiewereld. Um, hij is ondertussen al twintig jaar, of meer dan twintig jaar bezig, maar al twintig jaar digitaal aan het fotograferen. Um, en daar heeft Alex een presentatie over gemaakt. Uh, 20 years of digital in 20 photos. Um, lijkt me een zeer boeiende en een zeer interessante um, Facebook Live te worden. Um, al die foto's hebben hun eigen verhaal. Al die foto's hebben hun eigen um, ja, uh, achtergrond. En het lijkt me heel interessant en heel uh, tof om te weten wat het uh, verhalen zijn achter die foto's. So Alex... Um, The stage is yours. All right, let's go. Thanks. Right, I'll, I'll start by sharing my presentation. Um, let me just bring it up. Okay, great. Um, so I, it actually occurred to me relatively recently that I have been shooting digital SLR cameras underwater for 20 years now. And I, I'm not really somebody who likes to look back that much. I think as a photographer, you're always driven to look forward to create new things, not look at what you've done in the past. But with that anniversary, um, and I kind of got that, oh my gosh, it's been that long um, feeling, I felt it was it was nice just to pull this little bit of personal history together. Because I do think, although as photographers, you're best off looking forward, we can always learn something by by looking back. And I, I felt it was quite an interesting story in relatively few pictures. Um, I think to begin with, I think it's important um, just for my own personal history. And this is very much a, a personal story today, but I will try and relate it to what was going on in our community and, and, and some of the bigger things going around it. But I, I'd like to start by making the point that I've been shooting digital SLR cameras underwater for 20 years but I have been taking underwater photos for a lot longer than that. These were the oldest pictures I could find on my computer relatively quickly. And I took these while I was still at school, but um, although they're old pictures and you know, by modern standards, not particularly earth shattering, um, back at that time, you, know, you can see that I wasn't in 1993, a new photographer, I was already Um, knew what I was doing. You can, the picture on the right of the, it's actually a nurse shark inside a coral cave. You can see I was experimenting with getting my flash off the camera and that sort of thing. You can see the age of the picture actually by the, the dive gear favored um, by the diver, um, John Burt on the, on the left there, um, diving in, in the Caribbean. So these are the oldest pictures I could find, but I, I was actually taking photos. So sort of, I started underwater photography in the, in the 80s. And okay, I was, you know, like a lot of people, a one or trip, one or two trip a year type photographer at that period. Um, but um, anyway, that, that's kind of where my history goes back. And I actually, I think, got became quite well known as a photographer, much more in the film era um, than, than the digital era. And certainly the majority of my wins in underwater photography competitions were in that film era. And actually, I think once I started teaching photography, I stopped doing those competitions, really, because a lot of the people who I was teaching wanted to enter them. And it, it didn't seem right that they would, you know, come on my trip to learn photography for me and then would have to compete with me against me in, in the competition. Um, so for that reason, I stopped entering competitions sort of um, about the time I was well, in the early days of shooting digital underwater. Anyway, I'm going to jump forward now from 1993, uh, which are the oldest pictures in the talk. On to 2002, which is when I got my first digital SLR camera to take underwater. And one of the things, there's a couple of points to make. First of all, I actually had taken quite a lot of pictures with digital cameras before this time underwater, but never with a digital SLR. We, it was quite common in the late 90s, early 2000s to have half megapixel and one megapixel little digital compact cameras. And people would either make DIY housings for them that just had a, a kind of a shoot button. Um, or there was even the first beginnings of some commercial housings in that period. Um, I, I do think actually by tracing all these pictures back to the dates of the photo, it does really set the record straight. Um, 
One of the things, uh, you know, you find with, with history is people don't remember dates particularly well. And you hear lots of people going, oh, yes, I'm sure I was shooting a an S digital SLR in the late 90s. And I certainly remember in some of the early days of, of digital photography for me underwater, there was quite a lot of resistance to it within a lot of the photography communities. And lots of people would, t would you know, go out of their way to tell us that we were wasting our time and lots of people would tell us it's not proper photography and, and, and all these things. And then many of those same people, if they're still in the world today, are now, you know, keen to tell everyone that, um, although, you know, that they were shooting digital from the early 2000s. Um, and in reality, you know, it was sort of still 2005, 2006 that we were still getting a lot of resistance within the community from certain areas. I would say that a lot of the... Um, sort of sort of older photographers who are still around now were not the ones who were really resistant to it. They were actually fascinated by it, um, the rise of digital photography underwater. I think it was the ones that were resistant to it are the ones that most people who are around these days don't don't really remember simply because those people's sort of, you know, um, photography portfolios kind of stopped around this time, really. Um, anyway, what really fascinated me about digital cameras, and I think it's the thread that runs throughout this whole talk was their ability to take photos that I couldn't take with my film cameras. And that's what, what drove me in, into digital. Yes, it was great to be able to see results, although on those early cameras, the LCD screen pictures on the back were pretty damn small. You really didn't have a very clear idea about that much about what you were shooting, other than things were kind of just about coming out. Um, it was nice to be freed from taking just 36 pictures in those early days. But the things that fascinated me as a photographer was what the new technology could do for me in terms of being able to take images that I couldn't take before. And one of the first things I was interested in digital photography was the ability to shoot without flash underwater and to have correct colors, which was something that was pretty much impossible on film. Um, and the reason this was possible on digital, as we all well know these days, is digital cameras have adjustable white balance. But what we didn't have for quite a few of those early years was any ability to adjust that white balance in post-production, which is now obviously just the click of a slider or a click of a dropper, you know, um, um, a dropper in, in something like Lightroom or, or, or any other software on a raw file, you can immediately change those colors. In the early days of digital, the software really couldn't do that. You were stuck with the white balance you shot with. And actually, um, what this series shows is actually that a lot of those early cameras actually had white balance bracketing on them. And pictures B, C, and D are actually a bracketed series of white balance shots um, showing you, um, I think, um, showing you the camera actually varying the white balance a little bit because there was no way of doing that in post, which I think is something which is, you know, long forgotten. Thankfully, now we don't have that problem. But anyway, what really interested me was the ability to use this white balance to color correct underwater photos. And this was the thing I was probably most excited about getting my hands on a digital camera to be able to do. I had seen videographers being able to do this for you for a number of years with their camcorders going down and you know you come up on the dive boat and they watch their footage back and it's got all these lovely colors. And we know as still photographers, if we go down and take pictures on film without flash, we end up with blue pictures and they would have all these lovely colors. And, and that was something I was really interested in. And actually, this is some of my, this is actually with my first digital SLR camera. It was actually one of the first ones anyone had um, in Europe with a housing. One of the first tests I did was take it to the local swimming pool with my friend, um, Dan, who's um, in, in the pictures here and do, do pictures of him with, auto white balance, which is number A, and then actually setting a manual white balance, and in, in, um, which is, is B, and then C and D are the bracketed white balances from that. But this was my, my, my interest. And, and although these pictures are, are clearly just test shots taken in a dark swimming pool in the middle of winter, they showed a real potential. And they were definitely firing something up in me, which was to use this technology to try to take pictures of the like of which hadn't been taken before. And that's very much a strong thread through this presentation. So as soon as I could get that camera into clear water, I was keen to make use of particularly of that um, capability of, of the camera. And although this picture these days, you know, everyone who 
you know, sort of does a, a paddy specialty in, in digital underwater photography or, you know, gets taught the basics of taking a camera underwater, very quickly learns how to manually white balance a picture and, and get reasonable colours without flash. Back in 2003, this picture was incredibly groundbreaking. Um, it was actually, I, I, um, at the time, the the website WetPixel was the place where everyone went to interact and, and to share knowledge and advice on this fledgling um, activity of digital photography. And the thread that I started with this picture ended up with over 100,000 views um, and everyone fascinated by this idea of taking still pictures underwater without flash and still having great colour. And I think that was, you know, a really interesting um in use of digital cameras to to create a type of picture that you simply couldn't do on film. So um, it's one picture per year. So although I did lots of other interesting things in, in 2003, um, related to that, this is a picture from 2004 and a much better known picture than, than the previous one. This picture was a, a category winner in the, the Wildlife Photographer of the Year competition. And it's a picture of a, a boha snapper, which is a, a large sort of 60 to 80 centimetre long predatory fish that are usually solitary, but they gather in aggregations um, to spawn. And in the Red Sea, they gather in the summer months um, to spawn. And this is a photo taken of one of those aggregations. But the reason I find this picture interesting is it was taken, it was very much a technique, um, shot with a technique that simply, again, wouldn't have been possible on film because this picture here needed the help of some white balance to work. And this was really the area that was really fascinating me in those early years of digital was there were loads of photographers out there who had great portfolios of pictures taken on film. And I was really keen to grab the technology and, and to take pictures that couldn't be taken. And I, I do think that's a, a lesson that's well worth considering right to this present day, because the technology continues to march forward. And rather than simply asking, you know, what camera should I be using? You should be getting whatever camera you choose to use. You should be pouring through that instruction manual, reading the um, advertisements and the promotional material about that camera, understanding what that camera can do that other cameras cannot, and try to apply that to your underwater photography and create fresh images. Because there's no doubt that images like this were incredibly important for me forging a, a strong relationship and un, um, a strong reputation in underwater photography because I was breaking down walls. I was trying to create very different images. So this picture is a technique that I sort of later, um, you know, called telephoto photography underwater. And the aim was to take a picture through more water than you should. You know, one of the golden rules of underwater photography is, is get close, then get closer. And what I realised in these early days of digital is that I could break that rule a little bit. I could bend that rule. I used to give a talk um, called Digital Thinking um, around this time about, about digital underwater photography. And there was a, a quote from the Matrix film, which was also out at around this sort of time, um, where Morpheus says, you know, you, you'll learn, Neo, that, you know, some rules can be bent, other rules can be broken. And that was very much the attitude I took to digital photography, is what rules that I learned in film underwater photography could I break with this new technology? And shooting through a little bit more water, but still making sure I got enough flash onto the subject so that... I could restore correct colours with the white balance of the camera, enable me to produce an image that had a very unique perspective for an underwater picture. It's, it's very like a, a telephoto portrait of a, an animal on land, but you don't normally do that with a with a um, a, underwater because we just can't shoot through so much water. So the key to this technique was actually having my flash guns way out in front of the camera. I was using a relatively long macro lens to take this portrait. And as a result, I could push my flash guns forward in front of the camera without them being in the photo. And that shortened my light path from my flash guns to the subject and allowed me to get some color on the subject. And then the camera's white balance did the rest of the job, enabling me to take this, 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 this portrait. And, and obviously it was awarded at a, at a very high level. A point I'd make about that award, though, is that the Judges of that competition had no idea of my technique. They, the pictures are judged as images, not with all the backstory that you may read when you see the, the competition results. And I think it's a, for me, it's been a, something I've always tried to make a part of my competition winning images is to always create images that have something a little bit original about them um, technologically. 
um, that they're breaking new ground. The judges might not necessarily be able to put their finger on exactly what you've done, but they'll react to the fact that you have done something a little bit fresh, a little bit different. Um, during this period, I was, you know, continued to experiment with white balance. We were still stuck in an era where we had no post-processing control over white balance. I think by this stage, we actually could then choose to vary it between the camera presets, but we didn't have those nice handy sliders or droppers that we have these days. Um, but I was also realizing the limitations of using just white balance alone on its pictures in that it tended to suck all the color out of pictures and you ended up particularly with a water that was either purpley, but more commonly just gray. You lost all that rich watercolor. And so during 2005, and particularly with this photo, working with my friend Peter Rowlands, um, we developed filters for underwater photography that would work with the digital camera's white balance to allow us to take available light pictures underwater that gave us the best colors on the subject, while also keeping those rich blue backgrounds that made the pictures feel underwater. And this picture of the Janice D was one of these shots that we, we were developing the filters specifically to take. We've been taking this exact composition for years as a, as a blue slide film photo. And what became clear is we'd be able to do this, this very classic composition, but when in full color, making use of filters and white balance on digital. And this was very much still at a time when everyone else was shooting film. So we felt the pictures would really stand out if we could get these pictures right. And on this particular trip, I actually, and it's the only time I've ever done it, I've taken this picture hundreds of times since, but I actually persuaded our two dive guides from, from the, the Liverboard workshop I was running, um, Steve and Marlin, to, to pose by, on, on the wreck here. Um, so I always like this picture and I always remember that this is the two, this is the, the first fi um, filter picture of the Janice D because it's got the, the two dive guides in it, which I remember asking them to pose. And actually at this stage, the filter that we were using was a sandwich of three different filters from land. And it was very difficult to jam them into the back of the lens to make them work. And after the trip, I was getting really fed up with this. And Peter actually suggested that why don't we make a production run of this filter and, and sell some of the filters off to friends who all wanted to use this technique as well. And that's where our, our company Magic Filters was born. And certainly from sort of five to 10 years after this, they, you know, they were something that every underwater photographer really wanted in their back pocket, either for when their strobes broke down or, or indeed to take these types of different images. And I've used those magic filters for hundreds and hundreds of, of my own shots um, down the years. So um, into 2006, a little bit of a break from technology um, and, and also what was going on in my world at that time. Um, in 2005, I'd done my first book, which was called um, The Art of Diving. Um, and I got the opportunity to do a, a follow-up book um, the Art of Diving was very much an exploration about, about scuba diving and about the fun, the joy, the experience of scuba diving. Um, and in, in, in 2006, I was asked to do a book on coral reefs. And it was a book of, particularly about climate change and, and coral reefs. Um, climate, it, it, that's always been a, a big issue for me. First of all, working as a scientist for many years and um, working on on earth ecosystem issues and, and, and the role of the ocean in absorbing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. But also actually myself, um, when diving in the Maldives in the 90s, I happened to be in the Maldives when they had their big bleaching event in 1998. And none of us had a clue what it was at the time. It turned out to be at that point the biggest ever bleaching event ever recorded. And that for years just left me, you know, terrified for the future of coral reefs and, and to some degree that terror has never gone away. Anyway, that's what the book Reefs Revealed was about. It was about celebrating the amazing biodiversity of reefs, but also pointing out the, the threats that they face. And as part of that trip, I got the chance to, um, as part of that, that book, I got the chance to do a final shoot for that book in, in Raja Ampat and going down to Missoul at a time in 2006 when very few people had been to that area. The resort hadn't been built there. The liverboards tended to avoid Missoul um, area. I know it's now, you know, and actually one of the people who was famous for running liverboard trips to Raja Ampat specifically told us we were wasting our time going to Missoul. 
which always makes me smile because that person now, you know, or for, for decades since, um, you know, has pr promoted Misul as, you know, the very best of Raja Rampat. But anyway, we went to Missoula and then we actually also went on to um, Triton Bay in, in West Papua, again at a time when almost nobody had ever dived there. And I got the chance to photograph this species here, which was at the time, it's a species of walking shark. Um, they're a kind of a nocturnal group of sharks that like to walk on the seabed rather than swim. And at the time that I took this picture, it hadn't yet been described by scientists. It didn't have a, a Latin name or anything like that. So that was always a very exciting picture for me. And it's it's kind of it was a, a big sort of um, it was a very exciting picture to preview in the book. And actually, the book was published before the species was described. And that was a really nice, nice story for the book. I think technologically, the only thing interesting about this shot, it's it, it's one of my first dabblings into wide angle macro that sort of going beyond close focus wide angle into creating these these macro type images with wide angle. And to do that, I was using fisheye lenses attached to teleconverters behind a very small dome port. And actually, back in 2006, no one was commercially making mini domes for any of the housings. But I managed to find a really old one that I adapted to use on my, my housing and was able to do this type of photography on digital um, and, and, and have through that unusual lens combination and the fact that I, I had a mini dome and no one else did, able to produce a number of interesting images. It's not a particularly high magnification wide angle macro shot, I have to say, but um, it was taken using that setup, which enabled me to get this very sort of low down portrait, very different type of shot of this species. Having completed the book Reefs Revealed, I kind of felt that it was time for me to diversify my, my diving. And I think this dominated my career from kind of 2007 um, onwards um, in that rather than just sort of being a specialist on, on coral reefs. And, and particularly in those days, I used to visit Indonesia, Red Sea and, and the Cayman Islands kind of pretty much on a loop. Um, I began to really diversify the destinations that I was traveling to and really tried to build my portfolio up in terms of coverage to that professional level that I felt that, you know, I could get a phone call from from any publication going, have you got a picture of? And my answer would be, yes, I have rather than no, I haven't. And that meant for me really venturing properly into cold water diving. I'd done some of my early scuba diving in the UK but had then pretty much avoided cold waters from that point on. But in 2007, having just completed a book on coral reefs, um, it was time to, to dive into cold water properly. And one of my first big trips overseas for cold water diving um, was to, 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 to the temperate parts of Australia, both on the, the east coast and on the south coast. And this is a, a, a leafy sea dragon from South Australia. And I think what really pleased me on this trip was that I was able to take my style and my my vi visual um, approach to underwater photography and translate it just as equally whether I was in tropical water as cold water. And I think that really fired me up to pursue a lot of cold water diving over the following years. Um, and I was fortunate in this time because this was just the time when the cameras began to change and digital cameras used to be or in the early days of digital, were very, very bad at higher ISO. You know, if you had to put a camera up to ISO 400, it went, went to junk. Um, and just around the time I became interested in cold water diving, fortuitously, the cameras began to change. And that, for me as a Nikon shooter in particular, happened in 2008 um, with the arrival of the, the Nikon D3 full-frame SLR, which Nikon to this day still talk as being one of their absolute digital landmark cameras in terms of the, the new technology it brought, and particularly its high ISO capability. And the, the first trip I was able to shoot that camera on um, was a trip to Vancouver Island in Canada. There's Todd Mintz, uh, one of my dive buddies on that trip, in this photo. It wasn't really modelling, it was just um, I just it was just, just a photo. But um, I was able to use the D3 on that trip, which I was actually lent um, by by um, another friend from the Wet Pixel forums, um, Craig and um, Ryan Cannon from Reef Photo Video, now probably better known from from Naughty Cam. Um, Ryan Cannon lent me a housing, and I was able to shoot this camera. And it was really amazing to have a camera that 
just by clicking that ISO up a few clicks, suddenly the style of photography that you could do in these darker waters completely changed. And I know we take that for granted now, but to be there when, you know, the transition on, on film, we were often shooting ISO 40 or 50, Velvia. We were all maybe ISO 100 film. On digital, maybe ISO 100 or 200, but but never higher. And suddenly I could shoot ISO 800, 1000, 1600. And the difference that made in terms of image quality and opening up these dark dives was was fantastic. And I, I know we all have it now, but at that time it was really groundbreaking and it just completely changed the way you could shoot on these things. You weren't relying on long exposures and, and that sort of thing to get any sort of ambient light. You really could shoot almost like you were in bright tropical waters in terms of the look of the images. And you could really open up these dark environments. It was a really really exciting time. The technology really just changed that type of photography. And you could shoot with such image quality compared to what it had done before. And and that was was a really exciting time. And for a, a few years following that, I did a lot of cold water diving simply because it, I felt that was the area where the biggest strides could be made in terms of new imagery. Um, another great aspect of digital photography is that instant replay. And with that instant replay, you have the opportunity to experiment more. First, you can finesse your, the quality of your work. And I think in the early days of digital, one of the reasons digital photography leapt ahead of what had been done by the majority of people on film up until that point was simply because we could put that level of finesse into the shots. But I was always interested in not just doing what had been done before better, but trying to do something different as well. And the instant replay of digital photography made more complicated techniques such as off-camera lighting something that was really possible. And this is a photo I took in 2009 um, working with, with Adam Hanlon. Um, this is actually taken where one of the places Adam, Adam works in Cape and Ray. And we were trying to find a really good flash trigger. And at the time there, there was, there weren't one. The only one that was on the market was designed for cave diving and would only work in total darkness, which is fine when you're in a cave, but if you wanted to use that technology outside of a cave um, to, 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 to create off-camera lit pictures, you know, the technology wasn't there. And we actually made a, a homemade um, lighting system to, to trigger this shot and create this picture. And well, you know, these days it's kind of just a fun, quirky shot. The I, I think this was an image that really started a, a big trend in underwater photography and also a big trend in my own photography, utilizing these techniques, particularly on shipwrecks all around the world. Um, 2010 um, sort of brought a, a really unusual project um, for me in that the majority of my, I, I don't tend to work on big long-term projects, but during 2010 and 2011, um, I signed up to be part of a team on a British conservation photography project called 2020 Vision that involved 20 of the UK's leading wildlife photographers shooting wildlife stories all around the British Isles. And it was a really fantastic project, very exciting to be in, very ahead of its time in terms of what it was, was trying to do, both in terms of photography and conservation. And also for me, gave me the opportunity to actually have, until the current pandemic, my most dedicated session of British Seas underwater photography and the pictures taken on those trips. I think I, I've been showing for years, um, you know, such as such was were the fun. And I, I, it was I think what I found really exciting about this period of my underwater photography was the ability to surprise people. I think when people know that you've gone off to the, you know, to, to coral reefs or you've gone off to the Central Pacific, they expect you to come back with wow images. When you are simply diving in your own waters, and particularly when you come trudging up a beach and you stop and someone says, what have you been doing? And you turn your camera around and show them what you've just been photographing. That ability to surprise people was something that I really enjoyed in this type of photography, both in 2010 and 2011, shooting a whole range of different British marine life subjects all around the country. Um, this, these, are, these are puffins underwater, photographed in fairly murky conditions around the Farne Islands. And this was, you know, a, you know we, were, um, we had only limited funding, so we didn't have the chance to spend weeks and weeks in the field. And we 
we just thought we'd chance our arm and have a go at the puffins and were able to get these the, these images that became very, very well known and were real sort of poster images for the project. Um, so it was a really exciting time um, utilising the cameras. And again, taking on a risky subject like this is certainly something very much of the digital age. Um, 2012 brought another big jump in, in camera technology. And I took um, this photo here, which is, is also very well known up in Iceland. Um, it's kind of become the, the standard viewpoint um, to shoot silver from, um, which, you know, is, is great. Um, I think anyone who, you know, but at that time it really wasn't um, the tourist attraction it is now. Um, and what really excited me anyway about, about this particular shot was that the camera technology had really improved again from that D3 generation. This was taken on my very first trip with the Nikon D4, which was then, you know, the next big step forward in terms of camera technology and high ISO technology, certainly for me as a Nikon shooter. And I wanted to go somewhere that really pushed that camera to the limit. And I couldn't think of anything more challenging than this shooting this big scene of Silfra, but shooting it perfectly, you know, with absolute, you know, with great depth of field right the way from the foreground to the background, with excellent corner sharpness right out to the edges of the image. And to really, you know, create this, this feeling of space in an underwater picture in what is, although it looks bright, actually a very dark location, I think. Anyway, I mean, I've had lots of friends go to Silver and ask me, you know, where, how do you, where, what's the viewpoint? How do you get the shot? And the first thing I say to them is, it's going to be a lot darker than it looks in my picture. You know, get your head around that. Think about the settings. And I think this picture was taken by, you know, pushing everything to the limit to try and, and get that absolute best image quality while still getting that, you know, total sharpness throughout the frame. Um, and, and, and so, you know, being really driven by that leaping camera technology. Around this time, my, my love affair with the Thistlegorm Rex started. It was actually, I think, 2010 that I ran my first photo workshop dedicated to the Thistlegorm. We'd always kind of shot the odd day here and there. And as we got more and more into shooting this wreck and finding ways to shoot it, because it's not an easy wreck to, to work on and create images on, we slowly over time, and it was very much a group effort, although they were my workshops, it was very much about that team of photographers going down, everyone trying ideas, everyone coming back up to the boat, sharing their pictures with each other, everyone sparking off each other and getting ideas. And after a few years of doing that, I decided to and run a dedicated Thistlegorm workshop in, I think it was 2010. And that really got us to know the wreck and figure out exactly how we wanted to shoot it. And I think ever since then, we've just been creating more and more interesting images of it. But by 2023, uh, 2013, I was really, you know, I'd really sort of built a big portfolio of really interesting images around this, this famous shipwreck. And what I was realizing is I wanted to know what was in those pictures, what the subject, you know, what the vehicles were in particular. I know these are Red Sea soldier fish, but I didn't have a clue what the vehicles were. And when you went and I read all the books that were around on the Thistlegorm, they really were very sparing with details. Some of them had maps of the holes of the Thistlegorm that, you know, bared no relationship to how the wreck really looks. And it was just kind of very confusing. It was like, has this person ever even dived on the wreck? And what became clear at that time was that actually the information that was out there was just one person's hearsay that three or four people repeated and it became fact. And actually a lot of it was wrong. And that was really when it kicked off my interest, which kind of took five to seven years to come to completion um, of really wanting to get to grips with absolutely all the vehicles that are on there. And over this period, we actually went to the, the you know, went through the effort of photographing all the vehicles and then working with particularly military vehicle specialists to help identify them all. Um, and it was kicked off very much by having these, you know, really strong images. And, you know, you know, although my background's a marine biologist, I think the visual images that I could create on a shipwreck were just absolutely, you know, fascinating. And so I you know, really got into my wreck photography and particularly that ability to use off camera lighting to create really unusual and I think really graphically exciting imagery. Um, Going back to this sort of common thread of technology driving imagery, um, this was really um, a period where there was a lot of development 
in underwater high magnification optics. And, um, and one you know, particularly well-known one is Nauticam's SMC lens, which they introduced in, in 2013. We had the prototype in 2013. And by 2014, we had production ones of it. And this is a picture of a hairy shrimp that I shot with, with backlighting that's become very much, you know, kind of the way to shoot it. But this was the, 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 the first hairy shrimp with backlighting um, photos. Um, but it was really making use of this, you know, excellent high magnification underwater designed optics um and i think that naughty cam and particularly their their, their founder um edward lie deserves a great deal of credit for the boundaries that they've tried to push back in underwater imagery particularly in the realm of optics which to be honest everyone knew was a problem but no one was willing to take it on and um this was the start of really for me the optical revolution in underwater photography we kind of had this digital revolution that allowed us to do certain things and then that was followed by this optical re re um, revolution that has again extended our capabilities and you know suddenly with these new high magnification capabilities you know i suddenly became a, a dedicated super macro shooter because i felt that's where the new ground is is there to be to be made I was also working on my own optical systems um, or optical solutions. And this is a picture that also awarded in the Wildlife Photographer of the Year competition. Um, it's well known from that of a cormorant hunting beneath a oil rig off Los Angeles. And this is, again, a very dark environment, a very difficult place to to, to light up. And um, I wanted to shoot this picture not using a fisheye lens because all the straight legs of the oil rig, obviously, with a fisheye lens, go all sort of bendy um, and it's one of the few times underwater where fish eye isn't the the best solution um, but the problem was because it was so dark it was even with the high ISO of the cameras it was difficult to create the image I wanted um, because if I open the aperture up too much to let more light in the corners of the picture would go, go very very murky but fortunately I was working on a on adapting an old underwater lens made by Carl Zeiss, particularly for underwater photography. And I'd managed and I'd adapted it to work with my modern SLR. Um, and that's what I used to take this picture. And it was, for me, it was a picture that really showed me the value of these optical advancements that I could take a picture with a quality, with a sharpness from, you know, throughout the frame, particularly into the corners without, you know, without the distortion using you know, these optical solutions. And it really got me very interested and particularly working with Nauticam and Edward on the lenses they were creating, realizing that this was more, you know, this was very much, as I was saying, like the digital revolution. This was the revolution to get involved with now because this is what was going to be driving our possibilities as underwater photographers forward again. Um, but it didn't always have to be about um, high quality optics. Um, this is a, an early picture I took with the old Trio Plan lens, which is actually here, just, um, um, which is an old, you know, one of many old vintage lenses that, although not as sharp as a modern lens, create a really interesting look and particularly um, an interesting bokeh, um, which is the out of focus look of, of pictures. Um, and I've been using them since before this picture, but this is kind of where I really started to get my head around ways of using it. And actually, in the last edition of the Wildlife Photographer, the, the 2021, this year's edition that was announced last month, my photo that was awarded in that was also taken with this same lens. Um, so it's kind of an idea I'm still plugging away with. But actually, it all links into this, the, how optics for me now is as exciting as digital te technology in terms of breaking those barriers down and creating new types of underwater imagery. Um, this photo, um, I didn't really explain what it was. This is a, a close up of anemone fish eggs and there just coming into the corner of the frame is, is one of the parents, probably rather unimpressed by the photographer wanting to take pictures of its offspring. Um, 2017 meant a new camera for me as well. This is when I moved on to the the Nikon um, D5 camera. Um, and again, that just, you know, pushed the back boundaries back in terms of low light capability. 
Um, it was also um, my, my daughter was born in, in 2016. So I was traveling less of seeing this in in this period while she was still not yet one years old. And we actually in early 2017, while my wife was still on maternity leave, um, we went um, for a family holiday um, to, to Mexico and I managed to get a few days diving in. And I was really keen to go there because not only did I have the technology of the latest camera, I also had cutting edge optics. In this case, this picture here taken with the Nikonos RS 13 millimeter lens, which is a, a lens developed by Nikon as an underwater lens. So therefore a, it can be shot at a more open aperture than a dome port. I won't bore you with all the details of why, but that combined with my camera gave me a significant advantage for high ISO wide angle shooting underwater than people had had before. And the cenotes, which are actually a lot darker than everyone always imagines them when they see the light streaming down like this, they're actually quite a very dark place to take photos. And that technology really allowed me to take some really, really, um, I think, you know, strong images for that time of this environment that um, have always done very, very well for me, despite it being a family holiday and me only doing a few days diving during it. Um, Around this sort of same sort of period, Nauticam had created, um, had started creating some of their underwater wide angle lenses. First of all, the WWL1. And after much badgering from me, they made a WWL1 that would work with an SLR, which eventually, after a couple of iterations, became the WACP1 that many people now shoot. And this picture here, which is, again, awarded in the Wildlife Photographer competition, this picture here was made using that lens, um, you know, which, uh, you know, um, and again, just really that this technology was allowing me to create images that would have been tough with the other lenses out there. Also, this lens not only gave you the optical quality that, that was hard to achieve all the time with, with more traditional solutions like dome ports, but it also had a fantastic zoom range, solving, again, one of those big problems of underwater photography. You know, I think back to those, those first slides I showed of the, the Nikonos 5 pictures where you, you know, one lens, one angle of view, 36 pictures, We've now got, you know, lenses with huge zoom ranges. We've got, um, you know, unlimited photos for all intents and purposes on our dives, you know, and we've got this ability to have a shoot a huge range of ISO, a huge range of apertures and settings um, are available to us because of the optics on our cameras. And it really gives us so much freedom as underwater photographers to allow our vision to, to run wild, really, um, and create whatever images we can really dream up. Um, 2019 was, um, um, you know, the, the last year before the pandemic and, and I'm pleased to say I managed to travel, um, a great deal during, during that year, which was, was really nice. Um, this picture here is just, um, a standard sunset split photo that we, we take a lot on my, my Red Sea workshops, but a particularly nice one. And actually one in a place we don't normally do these shots on this particular night, the wind was blowing from a funny direction and it meant that our normal place for doing the shots wasn't available to us. And we had to go to a place that normally is, is too rough to do these types of photos. Um, and we were able to, to make, make this picture. Um, but I think that this is a shot that, you know, has always been possible since the days of film. Um, but really just falls into that category of one that you can add that extra finesse with digital. You can really, you know, just tweak the lighting, you know, tweak the settings until you get exactly the look you want and turn a relatively ordinary scene into one with, with tremendous impact. Which brings us to, to 2020, which is obviously a year that, that, that no one alive today is, is, is going to forget in a hurry being the year of the coronavirus. And although I was actually very lucky um, in that I'd actually managed to do almost 100 dives, I think, before um, travel got shut down at the end of March, I'd been, I'd already run a pair of workshops in the Cayman Islands and a pair of workshops in Cuba um, in the first part of the year. Um, obviously, my abiding memory of 2020 was diving in the UK. And this is a double exposure picture that I took um, diving in the summertime 
um, underneath um, Swanage Pier, which is one of our popular shallow water um, UK dive sites that's packed with life and also has some really interesting light that comes down through the sheltered calm water through the pier. Um, so this picture here is a double exposure showing both the light coming down through the pier shot with a macro lens and then obviously a portrait of the, the Blenny shot with a snoot. Um, and then bringing us right up to date. 2021 has involved a great deal of British photography, but I have finally escaped from, and I, I managed to dive in Italy as well in the summer, and I fan it, finally managed to escape from Europe in the last couple of weeks and I've just got back from the Maldives where I, um, this is one of the pictures I took. Um, this is a, again, this is another um, split level double exposure image. So created in camera, but these are actually, although taken with the same lens on the same dive, um, these are actually taken. These are, these are, are two images shot on top of each other. Um, and um, to create this split level image of the, um, the bar of the, the restaurant of the, um, of the, the resort we were staying at Six Senses in, in Lamu Atoll, and then um, a fluorescent photography image of the corals on the reef. And I've actually been working on a new fluorescent lighting system. Um, one of the challenges of fluorescent photography is that it's hard to, it's easy to see fluorescence, but it's hard to see fluorescence bright enough to make a, a nice photo. And so I've been working on my lighting system to get much more strobe power through my, through my filters. And actually working with Retra, we've developed a new um, lighting system to really give a punch to these pictures and, and hopefully they'll make it commercially available. At the moment, it's kind of just at a prototype stage, but it's really helping this type of image. So. I think in conclusion, I would say that um, my 20 years of digital photography have all been tied to looking for those advances in technology, looking for those um, images that hopefully bring something new and really constantly looking where the cutting edge is in terms of the technology and, and trying to think of ways that I can create an underwater image that I wasn't able to create before that technology came along. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Alex, for your wonderful presentation. We had a little problem with the synchronization between your uh, explanation and the photos in the live stream, but we have also the recording, so we will provide the complete recording on our YouTube channel. So um, that, uh, that's uh, the solution that we can provide for our uh, audience. Um, it was very interesting. 20 years of digital uh, underwater photography. Um, there is uh, a lot of uh, things that have uh, been changed uh, in that 20 years, of course. And it was very nice to see um, how your 20 years as an underwater photographer uh, was uh, developed, uh, developed in uh, about 20 years now. Um, for the next future, uh, Alex, what's on your uh, schedule? Um, well, I mean, immediately, um, this time next week, I'm going to the Red Sea for a week. All so right. I'm very happy to get another chance to do some intensive photography before the end of the year. I think every trip at the moment just feels like a, a wonderful opportunity, a, a blessing Absolutely. to be able to travel yeah. and shoot again. Mm -hmm. And, you know, all the trips also have that amazing feeling of reunion, not just with your friends on the dive trips, but seeing all those species that you, you love and, you know, we've, we've learned to love down the years, sort of, you know, going to the Maldives and seeing my first sharks again, going to the Maldives, seeing my first mantas again, seeing turtles again, seeing all the reef fish that, you know, you know, so well, you know, and I'm looking forward to the Red Sea, not just to see my friends in Egypt and my friends who will be coming on the trip, but also to seeing all the fish life out there. So that's my immediate um, answer. I would say um, technologically, um, in terms of the, um, the talk, people always ask me, oh, what's going to be the next thing you're working on? Although you're aware of what you're working on at the time, I would say nearly all the ideas in that talk, which I covered, um, none of those were things I was saying, you know, two years before, oh, in two years' time, I'm going to be doing that. Mm -hmm. For me, it's often the case that the technology drives the idea, drives the innovation. 
So um, I think that comes to me a lot is that, you know, it's not that I'm going, oh, gosh, I'm waiting for my camera to have this this feature and then I can do that. It's more a case that the technology comes along and then you get excited. Oh, goodness, that if you really understand the technology, you can really think about how you're going to exploit it. And then that takes your photography down a route. And I think for me, what things is important is that the images, although they are making use of technology, the technology and the solution isn't driving the narrative of the image. The image, you have to think, you know, you have to find the subject that really exploits that technology to allow you to say something different about it. But ultimately, the story needs to be about the subject, about the photo, and the technology is the underpinning. Mm-hmm. So that as a, you know, um, so that when, you know, say, an editor or a competition judge or whoever sees the image. Yes. They're not going, oh, that photographer was really clever doing this. They're simply going, wow, I've never seen an image like that before. Mm -hmm. That's really exciting. So the technology is driving things, but when it comes to the finished image, it needs to be slightly in the back seat because it's always got to come back to the subject. All right. Um, Some exciting times are coming now with all the new technology. So um, probably all the on the road of photographers, they are inspired now to uh, yeah to go uh, in the water with their camera and just try and and look for the subjects like you said and uh, use the technology uh, from that moment. Okay, Alex, thank you very much for your time. Um, probably we can do something in the near future or in the f- uh, uh, more further, further ch- future that we can do something in Holland, probably, again, as uh, 10 years ago already. Um, but let's stay in contact and we will see, all right? Slightly less Duval this time. <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay, perfect. Thank you, Alex. Bye-bye.